I'm in therapy for that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and, it, and it's interesting because it raises, and this is not my field of expertise, but it raises questions about what life is. Right. Because uh, it, you could say that life is just, it's about information. It's really computing is what life is. Holy moly. Some level. So it's not really, what you're saying there really is biology, the, the nature, the physicality that we think of as life. We think of biological systems with DNA and all those things. Right. But you, you can you can argue that that's not the really interesting bit. Right. That, that's just the way that it's realized. That's an expression. And really it's, an expression of, it's an expression of the yeah. true thing, which is the, computing, so. yeah, the computing, which if that is the case, then we have stumbled into the creation of life that will replace us, which is if we ever get to artificial general intelligence, and what you're saying is an emergent property of computing, which is also an expression of life, then it's only a matter of time before that particular computing becomes a life form, which of course will outthink us, outlive us, out everything us. Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and this is, you know, again- at Don't Cyber smile and while you're agreeing with him well, on that. No, it, it's Can interesting, I see a sad I, face I, for I, once on your on that mug? But one of the um, things I've been involved in, we have, um, I, I'm involved at a, a research institute called the Francis Crick Institute in London, which is a biosciences. It's it's a wonderful place. It's on, it's a temple to curiosity. I love the place. There's a, a great Nobel Prize winner called Sir Paul Nurse, who's a good friend of mine, who won the Nobel Prize for cancer research, actually by looking at what the yeast cells. So it's a, it's a remarkable sort of fundamental study of life. But he really pioneered the building of this institute or inspired it in his image, which is about Francis curiosity. Francis Crick co-discovered the DNA yeah, yeah. double helix. Oh, Crick, no that's way. why it's called the Crick Institute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but we did some podcasts called A Question of Science, actually, which are around. Um, and we just did them at the Crick Institute and with panels of experts. And it, so I just, it was wonderful for me because I just chaired it and asked the questions. Mm -hmm. And it was mainly audience questions, actually. But one of them was on AI. And there was an interesting split in the panel between um, the neuroscientists uh, and, the, and the computer scientists. Really? So, so the neuroscientists really felt that, for example, large language models, which is what we have at the moment, right. were just symbol shuffling things, and, they, they, and the, the brain is fundamentally different to that. So we are not large language models. I kind of feel that way about them as well. I it's, kind it's, of feel that way it's, too. It's just rearranging statistical juxtapositions of words. Right. And it's, it's it, seeing I, all I, the probabilities. I don't that's all. feel like it understands anything. Yeah. When I interact with a large language model, it's like this is vacuous eyes staring back at me and there's no soul behind it. Yeah. Well, the, the argument what one of the panelists gave was that imagine that, imagine that you're immortal. So time doesn't matter to you. Mm -hmm. But we, like we could be in this room if we were immortal and someone could start putting little symbols in under the door. And if we put the right symbol out, we'd get some food. Right. So we'd soon learn what the right symbol was. And then they put two through the door and we do the same thing. And then three. And ultimately, if we had a huge amount of time, kind of a near infinite amount of time, we'd end up having a conversation. Right. And we'd do it right. But at no point would we have any clue what was going on. We'd not have any understanding at all of what we were doing. It's, it's, it's a transactional exchange of simple information that itself yeah. is not anything more than just there's no understanding. Symbols. There's no understanding. That's, that's an, one of the points of view that were expressed. But the, was that the, the, the neuroscientist? That was a neuroscientist yeah. who said that. I think it goes back to the philosopher called Searle. I think there's a, an argument he made a long time ago about symbol shuffling, Searle's argument. So it's similar to that. But one of the computer scientists said, no, that, that irrespective of what you think about that, that's what we are. So we don't know what we are. We don't know what consciousness is. So it could be that that's all we're doing. We're, we're really, and it's true, I suppose, at the cellular level, at the level of a neuron. Wow, there's no understanding. Don't tell me it, that. Just, I don't. I don't want to think. I don't want to believe that stuff. Now that you mention it, yeah, there are acoustic stimuli coming from your mouth, entering my ear, hitting my brain, and now I process that, and some other response comes out, and maybe yeah. I'm not conscious yeah. of anything. No, you, you, you're just a, <laughs> like chatting. I'm just an uh, information, you're, you're processing. information processing and response machine. Mm. Yeah. It's very and possible. I, and I think that this debate is quite live, actually, amongst mm. people, or, and, and many people who all know what they're talking about, uh, and, and there are different views, which just shows you it's complex, a complex emergent yeah. phenomenon.
That makes sense. And that is why a lot of like, and these aren't like neuroscientists, computer scientists, but there's many in the AI world who feel like given enough time, you just train the AI on everything. If you have enough time and enough computing power, they will definitely be truly thinking. They're, they're like thinking the way we consider thinking. Yeah. Uh, Especially when you think of thinking in that way. Right. right. And it reminds me of a New Yorker comic, I think it was. There were two dolphins swimming, right, in, in this water park, and there are humans up walking on the, on the walkway. And one dolphin says to the other, they open their mouths and noises go between them, but it's not clear they're actually communicating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I get that there's emergence in these complex systems, but what is this talk I hear of emergence from the standard model of particle physics? What's going on there? I thought that's a pretty straightforward grid of what exists and what should exist or how they interact. If I understand the question right, so there are things, there are quite basic things about particles that are difficult to derive from the standard model. So the standard model is, you know, that the, here is the, the quarks and the, let's say, so up quark, down quark, electron, electron. It's an neutrino. inventory. Yeah, it's, so, so we have 12 matter particles, the Higgs boson, and then f three forces that it describes. It's an inventory. Yeah. And, well, and then it, and it tells us about the interactions, but it's got... So how particles interact with each other and through which forces do they interact?